Thank you, DonorSearch. We're so excited to kick off our opening keynote. Here at Virtuous, we believe that generosity has the power to change the world, but generosity also has the power to change the heart of the giver. And it's our commitment to help increase global generosity for all nonprofits. But what we're wanting to provide is more than just our mission. We have a framework and we have a methodology. methodology and we also are unveiling today a maturity model to help you identify where are you on the path to hyper-personalization so that you can unlock generosity with all of your donors to fuel greater impact for your mission. And so I'm so excited to welcome our CEO, Gabe Cooper of Virtuous, to unveil the responsive maturity model. Enjoy. Awesome. Appreciate it, yeah. <clears throat> I uh, thank you guys again so much for joining us. Thanks for being a part of the responsive uh, nonprofit summit again this year. So grateful to have you. When everybody was up here earlier, they mentioned these great sessions that happened yesterday. The one that didn't get mentioned was our amazing Brian Funk, who just left the stage. If you remember Coney 2012 from a few years ago, Brian was an integral part of that campaign and sort of provided the backstory for everything that happened behind Coney. Um, incredibly interesting talk that he gave. So I really encourage you to go back and watch that one. Um, let's jump into it. So what we found over the last, let's say, five years, as we've talked more and more about this idea of responsive fundraising and being a responsive nonprofit, is that nonprofits often don't know where to start. And so sometimes getting from sort of point A to point B feels a little bit overwhelming, like boiling the ocean. <clears throat> and so what we've really worked hard to do over the last year or so is provide a map so that people aren't feeling sort of stuck and like they can never accomplish these big things, but to have a roadmap to get from point A to point B to becoming more responsive. Um, and so that's our responsive maturity model. We're gonna spend a few minutes today sort of moving through that model. Uh, I love to start with this quote. So this quote by Paul Batalden is, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. If you're at a nonprofit today, and you're seeing results stagnate, you can't get to where you want to go. Honestly, it's because the systems and tactics at your organization aren't changing. If you want different results, you have to change the system and the tactics that you're using to move forward. And so what are those more traditional unresponsive fundraising systems? There's a couple of uh, common practices that we see across fundraising teams that create a certain donor experience and dynamics within the teams themselves, I think, that mark a lot of nonprofits. And, and I've been a part of nonprofits that fall into this bucket. So the first is this unresponsive donor experience. If you've been around Virtuous or Summit for a while, you've inevitably seen this, but I think it's really important to review. Um, as fundraisers, we're working hard to pull in a variety of folks to our organization. And so we have people coming in through events, galas that maybe were invited by a friend. They see something really compelling on social media. Uh, they know somebody that works at your organization or the cause that you're working on impacted them directly. Your donors and prospects and even volunteers are coming in with very different intents, very different reasons for giving. And it's all very personal to them. The problem is we often stick donors into sort of this set of direct response activities where all of these people, let's say they all give in September, in November they're all getting the same appeal letter in the mail, they're all getting our year-end campaign, they're all getting the same email newsletters. Basically the tactics we're using for cultivation and retention are one-to-many sort of spray and pray marketing based on our timing as a nonprofit. We don't have good uh, ways to listen to donors to find out what they really care about so it ends up being incredibly impersonal. As a result, nonprofits see really low donor retention. Um, it's not uncommon that nonprofits will have people that give one gift and 76% of the time they never give a second gift. Um, and we have really low advocacy. So from Brian Funk's talk again yesterday, Coney 2012 built that momentum built a lot around advocacy and ambassadorship and creating raving fans. And when we communicate with donors this way, it's really hard to build those raving fans. But there's a second part of this, which is an unresponsive team experience. And so in working with nonprofits for the last, I don't know, 15 years, 
I've consistently seen this problem where the fundraising team is siloed. Um, <coughs> I know a nonprofit, and it will re remain nameless, but the fundraising team sits in one building, and the program team sits in another building 400 yards away, and nobody ever crosses that parking lot. It is the worst feeling, and so we have fundraising teams that are isolated from the rest of the team. They're sort of marked by this, like a lot of manual data entry, a lot of manual reporting, a lot of frustration and burnout, and largely isolated. Same with the marketing and comms team. Often the marketing and comms team is sort of has a struggle with multi-system chaos where they're using four or five tools to get the job done. Um, and the KPIs, the goals that they're going after, are often disconnected from fundraising. Program is doing their own thing. Program often sees fundraising as like a necessary evil to do the real work of the cause. And there's no motivation for program to sort of feed back the impact that they're having in the world so we can communicate with donors well. And then finance and IT teams are often experiencing these sort of massive backlogs of back work. They feel like the speed bump to the organization rather than an accelerant to the good work the cause is doing. I hate this unresponsive team experience. But the good news is we think there's a better way. We think there's a more responsive model for generosity, both within the donor experience and within teams. So this is a more responsive donor experience. Again, if you've been around us a while, this shouldn't come as a surprise. Um, but to provide a great responsive donor experience, we know that we have to listen to our donors really well. You can't get to know somebody who you don't listen to. And so we have to build mechanisms as nonprofits where we can understand who each donor is, what makes them tick, what drives action, and what behaviors sort of motivate and indicate where, where donors are going to end up. Once we understand who donors are by listening well, we have to connect personally at scale. Um, and then once we've connected, we have to suggest the right next step at the right, right time based on who each donor is. And so when we do that well, here's what it looks like. More responsive, dynamic campaigns. So you can see from this picture, each of these donors are getting the right next step at the right time based on their behavior, their intent. Um, we've seen nonprofits do this incredibly well where they're sending out these more dynamic campaigns based on who each donor is. We see retention go way up. We see average gift go way up. We, feel, we see donors that feel loved and understood, and we see them deeply engaged in the cause. But we also know for this to happen, there has to be a responsive team experience where marketing and comms, finance, ops, IT, program, and fundraising are all working together in a healthy, effective way around common APIs or KPIs that are all aligned with uh, impact transparency. So program is feeding back stories around the change in the world. Those are getting circled back to donors. So we're closing the loop on our impact. And we see overall generosity growth. So you say, that sounds great. How do we get there? We yes, we, we've seen our organization at times be unresponsive. How do we get to being more responsive? Well, it really starts with what we think is a, a maturity model, or what we think of as a maturity model. You see maturity models used across different industries. They basically say like, hey, here's point A, where you start, and you can build on that over time with a set of like clear building blocks. So maturity models provide a clear action plan for how to get from A to B. They're blocks that build on each other, and they, they give you sort of provable results along the way as you're moving from unresponsive to responsive. And our mature, maturity model in particular helps provide team and tactics and technology changes required along the way. So this is our responsive maturity model. You can see it moves from sort of uh, left to right, where we're starting with data, health, and reporting. You can't be successful as an organization unless your data is in order. And you have clear reporting that your entire organization can see. We're going to dive into each one of these individually, but really data health and reporting is at the core of being responsive. Number two, you have to have integrated technology and integrated teams. Your teams have to be working together, and you have to have a single view of your data. You have to use segmentation and personas as the next step. That simply means you have to know who your donors are. 
to be able to put them in buckets to communicate with them in a more individual, personal ways. Four is dynamic campaign. So once you have segmentation and personas, you can move to more dynamic campaigns. Like we were looking at a slide, the slide a minute ago, where you're able to send the right donor the right thing, but at the right time based on their behavior. And then finally, the new frontier <laughs> that I'm sure you're all thinking about was, is how does AI fit into this conversation? And how do we think about personalization from an AI perspective? That's the model, starting with one, moving to five. And I'm gonna spend the rest of our time today sort of jumping into each one of these buckets to help you understand how to begin building a base and then moving up sort of the responsive chain. So let's talk about data health and reporting. Um, I love these two quotes. The first one is James Barksdale, former CEO of Netscape. He says, if we have data, let's look at data. If all we have is opinions, let's go with mine, I guess, right? And so, like, I've been around so many nonprofits where I'm in the room and there's not data to support decision making. We're trying to decide, should we do this new event? Should we send out this piece of direct mail? And there's no trusted data underlying that decision. And so it's whoever sort of bangs the table the loudest in the meeting has the strongest opinion. That's the direction we go. Um, and I hate that approach. The second quote is just as good, which is, in God we trust, all others bring data. So why is data health and reporting so important? Number one, it gives you confidence in your communication. Um, I personally have contributed to this problem, and I've been on the receiving end of this problem. And so um, a couple of great examples here. Uh, somebody's been giving to you five years, and they give a gift, and they don't get matched to their existing donor record, and so you send them a, a welcome series for a new donor. Hey, thank you so much for giving your first gift to the organization. They write you back and say, yeah, you're welcome. Also, I've been giving to you five years. What's wrong with you guys, right? Same thing on the major donor side. Somebody gives a gift of $50,000, and the next month they get a gift asked for $50 a month. Somebody volunteers, and you have no idea they've given to your organization before, so you don't know how to treat them any differently, right? We see this all the time where we have problems in our data, and those, that problem in our data rises up to become a problem in communication and begins to alienate donors, prospects, and volunteers. Number two is you have to have really good coverage on your contact info. So if we're gonna do a good job communicating with donors in a robust way, we have to have their email address, their phone number, and their address, just common sense. And we have to have team-wide vis visibility into our trusted API or KPIs and goals. So once we have good data in place, we need to make that data available and solid reporting to the entire organization. So what's that, that look like in practice? Well, the first step is your organization has to have really good software tooling to provide data health. And so you need tools that identify who are the duplicates in my database? Where do I have bad addresses? Where do I have bad phone numbers? You need great email hygiene. I can't tell you, if you guys look in your Google inbox this morning and go to the spam tab, you're gonna see emails from 20 nonprofits who don't have good opt-in and email hygiene policies and they're dropping to junk mail. They're never even getting read, right? So you have to have good email hygiene, which means good opt-in and opt-out policies. And there's even third-party tools where you can run your list through that third-party tool and they'll tell you whether or not those emails are valid or good. Um, and then uh, National Change of Address Database uh, recommend at least quarterly updates from National Change of Address Database to make sure you're capturing all of those people that move and you're staying in good standing with the post office if you're sending out a lot of mail. Um, next is you need policies for data health. Again, I've seen it so many times where organizations will use the same field in their database for eight different purposes or half the people will be filling it in, half the people won't. It creates just uh, this like rat's nest of bad data, and so you have to have clear enforced policies. Um, I recommend a regular cadence for your fundraising team and your operation team, even weekly to begin with, to look at data, to actually pull up examples of, of donor records in your database to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Let me go back one here. Um, and once you get that in place, again, shared real-time reporting, um, if you have to pull reports at your organization by going and asking one person who holds the keys to all data to go pull the report for you, 
you're not going to be able to move fast enough. There has to be a commitment to have everybody on your team have access to the reports and data they need in real time. And then finally, weekly KPI reviews around that data. So how are you keeping your entire team engaged in key reports and key metrics? And so everyone knows where you're going. We recommend with actually starting with three core shared API or KPIs. And so the reason here is it's, it's some organizations might have 40 or 50 reports. Nobody's looking at the same data every day and you lose focus. Realistically, teams, and this includes our team here at Virtuous, honestly, is you can't actually absorb more than about three to five core metrics that your entire team is chasing after. <clears throat> here I've showed three <clears throat> what I think are critical ones, which is giving revenue by tier, how diverse is my set of givers around small donors, mid-level donors, and major donors, and do I feel exposed in, in any chunk of giving within mid, major, or low? What's my average gift? Am I driving that over, up over time? And what's my donor retention, particularly what's my first to second gift donor retention? So how, how am I moving donors from one gift to their second gift? It's a great predictor of database health. So you don't have to use these three core metrics, but I do really encourage you to limit down to three to five core metrics that your entire organization is lining up around. So that's data health, right? We have clean data that we can trust. We have great reporting on that data, so everyone is lined up around the same goals. Everyone knows their number and is moving hard after the same things. Now we need integrated tech and teams. So uh, <clears throat> this is a top 11 list. Came off a G2 crowd, but I absolutely loved it. I'm not going to go through all 11 reasons you should integrate your software, but um, I will call out three of them here. Number one, organizations that have well-integrated software with a single view of their data have much higher employee productivity because they're not caught in like that spreadsheet hell of importing, exporting stuff, one hand not knowing what the other hand is doing. So your team is able to be much more productive with less wasted time. You have a 360 degree view of, of it says customers here, but donors, prospects, volunteers. Right, And so you have a full view of everything happening with that person on all channels and every way they engage. And you get dramatically improved efficiency across your teams when you do this really well. So why is this important? Again, increased team collaboration with cross-team shared KPIs. So marketing, program, fundraising, even IT and ops knows what your North Star metrics are and they know how their decisions individually drive to affect those metrics. Um, you need integrated marketing and donor data. One of the biggest problems we see across a lot of nonprofits is, you know, maybe they're sending uh, an email from MailChimp, which is a great tool, love MailChimp, but then they got donor data in a completely different place. Their major donor team has no idea what digital touch points donors are getting day to day. There's a disconnect with marketing and comms data in one place and donor data in another place. Uh, once organizations figure that out, it's then really important to begin bringing in program data into marketing and fundraising so that you can begin closing the loop with donors so that your program team can say, there's this amazing story of a life that was impacted just last week. We need to tell that story to donors. And unless you're able to close the loop across your teams in tech, you can't do that. Same thing with volunteer data, understanding which of your volunteers give, which of your donors volunteer, critically important. So in terms of the tech, the tactics and the team to do this, again, um, you don't have to have one single tool that does all of these things, but man, those tools better be integrated, right? And so across um, email, SMS, web, CRM, your donor data, your major donor data, your volunteer data, your program data, they all need to be integrated through tech. Um, we recommend having quarterly cross-team goals. If you've never done quarterly goals that are shared across your team, I really recommend the book Measure What Matters by John Doerr. There's another book called Traction that's about the EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System Framework. I, both of those books are great in terms of creating quarterly goals that are shared across your team that everybody's driving after in the same direction. And then finally, we really recommend this idea of a generosity ops team. That's a newer term in our industry, but I want to get into generosity ops and why it's important. 
I'll do that now. So this is a diagram of what a generosity ops team could look like. So the idea here is that when we're all doing our individual jobs in our individual silos, so fundraising here, program here, IT and ops here, you lose insights across your entire constituent journey. It's really hard for everybody to be pulling in the same direction unless you have a layer that shares insights and learnings across all of the teams. And so what we, we call that function is generosity ops. And so you can see the generosity ops team on this diagram. They actually span all of the teams. It's a, it's a cross-functional team. At some organizations, you may not be big enough to have a team here. You can have a person to start out with, right? Or even a small committee. But what that committee or team is supposed to do is get, get garner insights from donor development, marketing comps, program, finance, and ops, and pull those insights together in one package and then share them across the teams. Um, it's it's going to help you have common reporting and, and, and KPIs. I think if you have somebody on this team that knows data just enough to be dangerous, so they can pull data together in one clean, coherent package. And I think that team should have a generosity focus. That's why they're called generosity ops. So what impact do we need to have in the world? How much generosity do we need to get there? And then they're, they're all sort of coalesced around this idea of how do we structure the organization and the constituent journey to get the generosity we need, to get the impact we need, and they work across all teams. Organizations that are doing this, they, I can't tell you how fast they are able to accelerate giving and impact within their organizations. So that's a generosity ops team. Okay, we have data health, where our data is healthy, we can trust it, we have confidence in it, right? Our teams are integrated, moving in the same direction with a shared set of data and a shared set of goals. Now we need segmentation and personas. So to get to that magical world where every donor is getting something more personal to them, we have to be able to know who those donors are, which requires us listening to donor signals, figuring out what each donor cares about, and then putting those donors into buckets. If you've been around fundraising a while, you've used segmentation. Um, Maybe our direct mail people on here know RFM segmentation, recency, frequency, monetary. It's a way to bucket donors by their giving. But we really think you need to push into this idea more than just thinking about how am I creating segments in a direct mail piece, but more thinking about um, what does each donor care about and how can I group similar donors together to have a more personal conversation. And we're doing that because we know this, personalized experiences drive generosity. Giving is one of the most personal things you will ever do. And unless your organization can lean in and sort of love you and respond to you and know you in a more personal way, it's, it, you're not gonna get the, gener uh, the generosity you want. And so what does that look like? It means creating personas based on people's affinity, what they care about, the topics that they're interested in, their giving, their engagement level. Uh, Dr. Bertrude on stage yesterday talked about their organization moving from uh, crisis giving in Haiti, Haiti to long-term systemic change in Haiti, like changing the engine of the car rather than just giving it a new paint job. You might find some of your donors are great crisis donors. They're horrible giving to systems donors, right? Or vice versa. You need to know who those folks are so that you can bucket them and, and talk to them appropriately and move them to the next stage. You, your organization may cover two or three topics, but some donors all, all only care about one. You may have a bunch of college kids that are really fired up about your cause. They're never going to give, but you need to activate them in different ways. And so we actually say, hey, if you can um, narrow down your core personas that you're talking to and actually make up a fake person, give them an avatar, give them a name, Describe everything about them and what they care about, and then try the best you can to bucket folks into these key personas. So it's better to start with just three to five core personas of the donors you want to communicate with. Sometimes it can become unwieldy if you try to fine tune these buckets too much to start with, and you have like 50 different fake people that you're trying to put people in the buckets. It's too much too fast. So start with three to five core personas. To do this, you're going to need great tech that can hopefully automate some of your segmentation and automate tagging. So 
Um, let's say you have somebody that shows up at one of your campus advocacy events. If you can recognize that and tag them as one of your college advocate personas, that's great. Less manual data work, real-time tagging and segmentation of donors so that this doesn't become just an unwieldy thing that you don't have time to do. And for this to work, it means uh, your marketing team, your volunteer team, and your fundraising team need to all be aligned on these key personas. If you have three core people that you think you're talking to as your fundraising team, but your marketing and comps person is thinking about three different people in a completely different way, then all of your marketing sort of comms efforts are gonna be completely disconnected from fundraising. So it's important that those teams are aligned across all of those personas. So the next big step here to do this well is actually multi-channel fundraising. Um, love this quote. This is from a study we did with Next After a year or two ago, which says multi-channel donors, those who give both online and offline, are worth three times more than online only or offline only donors. And their first year retention rates are two times higher. Man, those are incredible numbers. What that means is if you have a donor who's engaged with you on digital, let's say email, but they also gave an event, they also gave on direct mail, those people are exponentially more valuable. You want your folks to be engaged with you on multiple channels, SMS, email, phone, in-person meetings when it makes sense, events. The more channels you can get them engaged in, the better they're gonna do over the long haul, the more loyalty you create. For this to work, you have to be able to tell a single story to your constituents on multiple channels, which means the email that you send out needs to feel connected to what they may be heard in the event, needs to be, feel connected to what they're getting in their mailbox at home, right? You have to tell a coherent story that reinforces across all channels. And by the way, it needs to be integrated into your major donor strategy. So what we often see is um, major donor folks that are pushing for a big campaign or a particular strategy but then those major donors might be getting direct mail pieces or email that seems really disconnected from what they're hearing from maybe a major gift officer. You can see there kind of a picture of what this will look like. We actually have a campaign mapped out where I know I'm gonna have multiple touch points, um, mobile, mail, email, all moving in the same direction. Um, so again, obvious tech tools to make this work, which is integrated email, SMS, and CRM. I think it's important that you sort of map out a donor journey. So if you know a campaign is gonna have multiple touch points on multiple channels, you need to be able to map that out and kind of get a sense for what the donor's gonna feel. Um, create a connected story. And I, I think there should be at least monthly cross-team camp campaign planning meetings with input from program. And so marketing comps, fundraising, major gifts, all doing monthly checkpoints on what we expect our constituents to get over the next month or two, and then pulling in program as much as possible to make sure the stories that we're telling in those pieces are up to date, they're fresh, and they're sort of maximizing how our constituents understand impact. Uh, the other part that's really useful here is actually third-party data signals. And so when you can take that sort of segmented approach segmenting people into personas, and you can overlay things like wealth data. Like what's their giving capacity? Are they a potential plan giver, right? And other third-party data points like uh, consumer data that might tell you um, what topics donors might be interested in, how old they are, do they have a religious or political affiliation? All of those data points can then be added to your donors to help you more easily bucket people into the right personas and talk to them with the right voice and the right message. So to, to pull this off, you're gonna need wealth data and demographic data connected directly to your CRM and marketing. Uh, if that data is in a separate warehouse and it's not actionable, like, you know, then it's gonna be basically only your major donor folks that know somebody's high capacity, I should probably talk to them. It's not actually actionable in any meaningful way across your direct mail strategy your email strategy, your text strategy, your event strategy. So that CRM and, and marketing need to be connected in with wealth and demographic data. Um, we love the idea of automating major gift portfolio assignments. So if somebody gives a gift online, we should be able to pin wealth data, for example, in real time 
recognize that that person's maybe higher capacity than their original $50 gift and assign that person to a major gift officer's portfolio. And so instead of waiting two quarters to realize I have a lot of pent up capacity in my database, we're reacting in real time to be able to have higher touch points with higher capacity givers. And which requires marketing, fundraising, and major gifts to sync on what key data points they're looking for and what actions we're gonna take. So dynamic campaigns, we're moving right through this. We have data health, good reporting, integrated teams. We've now segmented our donors into personas. <clears throat> now we wanna move to dynamic campaigns, which is much like the graph I showed early on, where each person gets the right thing, but at the right time, not all at the same time. So when we're doing dynamic campaigns well, we're sending individualized campaigns on multiple channels, email, SMS, mail, but we're driving it based on donor behavior. So instead of sending everybody the same thing at the right, same time, now we're sending people the right thing at the right time based on their behavior. When we do that well, we get something like this where Eric here, and Eric's been on stage, love that his picture's in here. He gives his first gift to water campaign. We know what he's gonna get, right? Uh, we have um, Charlie here who clicks on an email and downloads a PDF we know exactly what he's gonna get on multiple channels. Dynamic campaigns based on donor behavior, based on where they're at and their donor journey and what they care about. Um, the key for dynamic campaigns is marketing automation. Um, I wish I could see a show of hands in the audience to see how many of you guys today are using marketing automation. If you're not, you should be. This is the only way that you can run dynamic campaigns. There's no way your team today has time to curate individual experiences with each donor individually. But it's possible. You guys have experienced other brands like, let's say, Amazon or Netflix, who magically seems to know who you are and can send you the right thing at the right time. It's not because they have a bajillion full-time staff following you around like a stalker. It's because they're using marketing automation with data intelligence to be able to automate the right thing at the right time based on where you are in your donor journey. To do that, you're gonna have to map out these constituent journeys. I would say only two to four to start. Like start with like a new donor welcome series that's automated on multiple channels. A retention um, strategy, maybe a lapse reactivation strategy where somebody hasn't given in 13 months. You're sending out multiple things on multiple channels to sort of bring them back in the fold. Just start with two to four. Um, and then for this to work, your program uh, team is gonna have to work with marketing team to connect what are the key stories each donor needs to hear at each stage in their journey, whether it's a new donor, a lapsing donor, maybe somebody who's a college student and an advocate, what do they need to hear? Uh, bonus here is inbound campaigns. We want opportunities for a small yes with a focus on SEO, influencers, and related sites. I won't spend much time here, but it's worth looking up inbound marketing and making sure that your organization is teed up to do inbound marketing really well. It's the idea that we want to draw people into us with really compelling co content, convert them to a prospect, and then move them along a journey to becoming a donor. All right, that's dynamic campaigns. Now AI personalization. Honestly, we're not gonna spend a ton of time here, but I do want to acknowledge a couple of big moves in the world that I'm sure you're all thinking about as nonprofits, which is how should I be thinking about AI as a fundraiser? And so um, I think there's really two big buckets right now where we've seen nonprofits be really successful with AI. And that's the first one is how do I predict the response? So what AI can help you with is looking at all of your data and saying, of the behaviors in all of my data, which of these people are most likely to give a major gift? Which of these people are most likely to churn? Which of these people are most likely to become a recurring giver? AI and machine learning can look at your data, continue to learn through the, that data, look for key behaviors that have happened in the past and predict a future behavior. You know, becoming a major donor, becoming a recurring giver. The, it's really important or a really powerful way to predict what the next behavior will be from each donor. And then the second one, I'm sure a lot of you guys are doing this already. Um, honestly, I think like if you're under 25 right now, you're probably living and dying by GPT. 
Um, but tools like ChatGPT can help nonprofits today begin accelerate content creation. So if you haven't used ChatGPT yet, get in and use it, try it out. Just type in something like, write a, a fundraising email based on the content on this web page, and you're going to be shocked by how well it does that. And so use GPT to be able to accelerate content creation, accelerate email writing, SMS writing, blogs. Um, by the way, don't just have GPT write something for you and then copy and paste it into an email. Proofread it, make it your own, fact check it, add your own voice. Incredibly important, but make sure you're making use of that tool to accelerate content creation. Um, to do this well, <clears throat> you need integrated AI modeling uh, in your CRM. You need GPT. Um, on your marketing team, and so you're using things like ChatGPT to accelerate content creation, and uh, all integrated across all of your tools. Um, starting with AI to predict retention, major gifts, and response rates. We already talked a lot about that. And then I would say as soon as it's possible for you, stretching to hire a data scientist, and then in the meantime, leaning in to find AI-ready partners who can come in and help you sort through how can I apply, apply AI and machine learning to be able to better predict responses of the people in my database today? Hopefully that's helpful. <clears throat> that's our model. Um, there's much more to learn here. This was really three hours worth of content packed into 45 minutes. Um, but hopefully it's a helpful starting point. If you are interested in learning more, we have a downloadable one-cheater that describes each of these stages in this sort of responsive maturity model, allows out some, uh, or lays out some key bullet points in each area. Um, a month from now, we're going to have an ebook that we're going to be sending to you that'll be 40, 50 pages sort of going through detail, team and tactics needed in each area. We'd love to be able to send those to you. Um, so make sure to go to virtuous.org slash model and download that cheat sheet. Um, and then to help me sort of talk about the next steps, I want to introduce Burke up. And so Burke's going to talk a little bit about what we're doing to sort of engage a community around these topics. So Burke. Thank you. So great to be here, Gabe. So great. I love that maturity model. So well, we're excited to launch today. You can go to virtuous.org forward slash model. You can download the PDF, a step-by-step -step guide to getting where you're at to where you want to be in this journey of hyper-personalization. If you'll go to the next slide, we'll talk about something we're doing today. So we want to keep the good vibes going. I was just looking at the chat and how grateful I am for everyone on the chat willing to dive in and help each other. I saw a, a small group that was getting started just today. Um, that's what we believe is possible as we come together as a nonprofit organization and community to help with this, we're going to do a virtual one-hour meetup that's going to build, build, be built by this community. So when you go to the virtuous.org forward slash model, all you have to do is say, hey, I'm in. This will be open to everyone. We believe personal development can be accessed by anyone in any part of the world, so good and generosity is accelerated. We'll do knowledge sharing in these meetups, just like we've done here. You'll meet industry experts like you've seen here. There'll be breakout sessions real-world use cases. So this model that Gabe just talked about is not just a piece of paper, it's reality. The future is responsive. It's hyper-personalized. This is very personal. Gabe knows that. We're super grateful to bring this together. Let's build the future together, and we have it. This, so join the community. You'll get more emails about this. You can join right now by going to the model. And uh, we're excited to end this session. And there'll be a 10-minute break. Day two is here. Thank you for everyone joining. The great comments, keep them coming. Share this on social media, tag a friend, and let's do it. Day two. Thank you guys so much.